please turn to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, we'll start in verse 1. So yesterday, I was doing a study, and I found something I, I hadn't noticed. Read through it, read through it. I know as you read God's Word, every, every Christian does this. You find new things. And many times it's things that were just right in front of your face, and you just didn't notice. And this is one of those. And since yesterday morning, I've been enjoying telling everybody. <laughs> it's just a neat, it's a neat truth that I never noticed, and it's very simple. But we're going to start in Matthew chapter 17, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8. It says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as a sun, and his raiment as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter, and said unto Jesus, Lord... It is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they so saw no man. Save Jesus only. And uh, this passage here is the Mount of Transfiguration. It's very well-known story, very well-known. We've read it, we've heard preaching on it. It's something that is... is it's almost iconic. It's something we can go to immediately. We can see Jesus. We can picture in our minds Jesus glowing. And it's, it's almost a picture of Revelation chapter 1. But rather than getting down those trails or anything, I'll just keep moving here. Um, my question to you immediately would be this. What is the significance of Moses and Elias being there? Elias is Elijah from the Old Testament. What is the significance of those two being there? I had always thought it was just because they're significant figures in the Old Testament. So you read about Moses, you read about Elijah. Okay, it makes sense that they're standing there with Jesus. They're, they're important figures in the Old Testament. And I, we've heard the discussions about these are the two witnesses and revelations and all those discussions, which I think are fun. They're annoying to some people, but I think it's fascinating. But that's not where I'm going to go with this. There's an amazing truth in when you realize what Moses and Elijah are doing there in this passage. And I had always missed it, um, the, the, the core of it. We can easily see Jesus is the focus of this passage. It's talking about Jesus. And that is the focus. But there is a significance that Moses and Elijah add to the purpose of this entire event. And the significance is what I think is such a neat truth. We, we can see here, and I, I haven't said exactly what it is yet, but we see in this passage, God is correcting the wrong thinking of at least one of his disciples. And I think he's correcting here as an example to Christians down through the ages, the wrong thinking of Christians. And uh, some of the people, I, I talked about this yesterday, so they're going to get some of the things I've said already. But I think you have to look at this entire passage, chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, like a funnel. I think it's a funnel. Basically, it's like you pour oil into your engine and it goes into the funnel. This passage, verses 17 through verse 8, is that funnel. And I'm going to go through real quick. This is just introduction. But I want to talk about each verse in this passage just to clarify it real quick. We see in verse 2. Well, first, in verse 1, we see Peter, James, and John, and they're going up into the high mountain with Jesus. And actually, before I go any further, let's pray. Father God, Lord, help me. 
Uh, Lord, help my, my thoughts to be your thoughts. Lord, help my words to be your words. Lord, I am incapable, but I know, Lord, you use small and weak men. And Lord, you are capable. So Lord, guide me in this. May this be an encouragement and a help to the people here. Lord, I know it's such an encouragement to me, such a neat truth. And Lord, I, I just pray that you would guide me in this. Uh, help me in this, Lord. And open hearts, open our understanding, because I know I've heard this many times, but it never clicked. Lord, I, I pray that, that people would understand and eyes would be opened if they, they didn't see this truth. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, verse 1, we see that we see Peter, James, and John, and Jesus takes them up into a high mountain. In verse 2, we see Jesus is transfigured. He's changed, and it describes a little bit of it. And his face does shine as the sun, and his raiment as white as, as light. And I said yesterday, um, I'm going to say now, this, it seems like it's almost a picture of Revelation chapter 1. You see the same description. Jesus is in his glorified form. They're seeing him in his glorified form, which is just a tremendous thought in and of itself, um, what that will be like to see Jesus like that. Moving on to verse 3, though, we see Jesus is standing and talking to Moses and Elijah. So they appear in bodily form, and they're talking to Jesus. And that's, that's where it, it gets interesting because I never really caught it. It's just like, oh, he's talking to Jesus. Okay, we move on to, through the passage. But this is what I would ask, and this is where it starts to kind of come into focus. What does Moses symbolize? That's the question that I didn't ask, and I should have asked ages ago. But now I'm asking, what does he symbolize? Moses symbolizes the law. He, that's what the Jews even today look at. They look to Moses and the law. They don't look to Jesus Christ. They've rejected him. So Moses symbolizes the law. What does Elijah symbolize? Elijah symbolizes the prophets. So we got the law and the prophets that are present here talking to Jesus. And there's tremendous significance in those two and what they symbolize standing there talking to Jesus. And the next verse it describes why. So verse 4, we're moving down. It says, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias, or Elijah. And here's the mistake. We can see the mistake. Peter has the wrong thinking. He mixes the significance, or he confuses the significance of Moses and Elijah with Jesus. He basically elevates them. And when you realize the symbology and what they are to the Jews even, Moses the law, Elijah the prophets, he's put him up there with Jesus. And this is what this whole passage, I believe, is directing and funneling. And we're going to get more and more targeted as we go. But they, he didn't understand the significance of Jesus. Peter didn't. When he said this, it shows, it's evident because he puts Moses and Elijah right up there with Jesus. So we move down to verse 5. And this is where God the Father intervenes to point out that Peter is wrong, basically. So verse 5, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. That's God the Father speaking. Verse 6, disciples, we can see that the disciples heard that voice. They fell on their face, and they were afraid. In verse 7, it says, Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And again, I, it's just a thought and just a connection. I think of Revelation chapter 1 again, where Jesus said, Fear not to John. And it's really kind of fascinating, too. John's of both events. John, this happens to John right here. And then happens to John in Revelation chapter 1. It had to be a weird situation for John to see this happen two different times. But it was just a connection. But here in verse 8 is where we see the end of the funnel. We see where everything has been directed down to one point. And the verse says, And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man, 
save Jesus only. And those are the words that caught my attention. Save Jesus only or Jesus only. And what we see here, we see a demonstration of God presents how the Jews combined the law, combined the prophets. They, they held them up with Jesus, even the disciples. And God removes those two, shows his son, declares his son. And when they bow down and when they stand up, all who's, the only one that's there is Jesus. And it's a picture. And I never caught the significance of Moses and Elijah and what they symbolize and removing them and just leaving Jesus there for them, what that symbolizes, the picture of that. It's a tremendous picture. That hit me yesterday morning. It's just one of those things, maybe everybody here knows it, and I didn't. I never saw it. I never got it. But it's one of those things where you go, praise the Lord, and you're walking around. It's like, the Lord showed me something new this morning that I just kept missing. But I want to actually talk today, and... I want to talk about the end of the funnel there. I will point out here that this right here, this picture, is a picture of many other passages in the Bible. We can see this all over God's word. Matthew 5, 17 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That's Jesus talking. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Luke 24, 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets in the Psalms concerning me. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And that's what this passage is pointing at. Jesus only. I, I love that. Um, we see another passage, the Jews. The Jews would read the law and the prophets. They would focus on that, the first five books of the Bible. And we see that in Acts 13, 15. It says, After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And at this point, I'm not going to read the whole passage, it's when Paul stands up and talks, and he talks about Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful passage about how Jesus fulfilled the law. So, And the Jews just didn't get that. And so today I'm going to focus on this Jesus only. And this, this is meant for encouragement. That's why I'm preaching this today. I believe it's encouraging to Christians. The, the thought of our Savior, the thought of our wonderful God, and how our salvation is in Jesus only. And um, so I'm going to, the first point I'm going to make today is Jesus only for salvation. And before I start this, I have to, lay a foundation, because I know there's some confusion, and I didn't realize until I was doing some research on this, that there's confusion about the, those two words, Jesus only. And I'd have never guessed it, because it seems very, I mean, very self-explanatory. But there's a lot of confusion. When I say Jesus only, I'm not denying the work of the Holy Spirit or God the Father. There is a trinity. Three persons of God. Each is distinct, but all God, the Trinity. Also, I'm not agreeing with this Jesus-only movement, which I had no idea existed. There's a Jesus-only movement out there, and it's a oneness Pentecostalism. I've heard of that, but I never heard about the, the Jesus-only. They actually don't believe in the Trinity. They believe in modalism, uh, modalism, modalism, I think is what it is. It's basically Jesus Christ has split personalities. At one time, he'll act as God the Father. At one time, he'll act as Jesus. At one time, he'll act as the Holy Spirit. But he changes for the situation. That is a, a gross error in God's word. And he manifests himself. That, this is their belief. that He manifests himself as the Father at times, Spirit at times. And this, what this comes from, I believe what this comes from, is from them trying to understand the Trinity in a way a man would. So, describing the Trinity as in three persons, yet they're all God, each one individually is all God, is hard to grasp. I mean, we can't grasp that. That's divine. It's God. But understanding somebody with split personalities, that's all around us in the world. 
So they drop down to a, well, he has a personality at this time, he acts this way at this time. They, they basically combine God to what they can understand, which is, we can't do that. It's a, a horrible error. The truth is, and this is just laying the foundation, God is a trinity, triune God. He's a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Salvation, I love this truth. We learned it in Institute. Institute is so valuable to go through. If you've never gone through it, sat in, so many things to learn. But this is one thing I learned, and it helped me think about the part that God plays in salvation. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. What part does each one play in salvation of mankind? Salvation is from the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. It's a very clear way of presenting it. Sent from the Father, through the Son, and by the Holy Spirit. And I love that. It was one one thing we learned in Institute. But each person of the Godhead plays a part in our salvation. And it's a wonderful thought. There's so many passages that present the truth of the Trinity. Our triune God, three persons. Um, just verse 5 in the passage we read presents it. It says, While he had spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice of the, out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. How would somebody that thinks Jesus is two personalities, and I think Pastor had said somebody had written about him throwing his voice, or something like that, ventriloquism, or... It's absurd. There's no way to explain that. That's God the Father, God the Son. It's a demonstration of that. So many other passages. I wrote a bunch down. Um, Genesis 1, 26. Genesis 3, 22 through 23. John 14, 16. Um, here's Jesus in John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So Jesus is praying to the Father, and he shall give you a comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. That's all three right there. Yet some people think that's him, all three of them. I don't get it. I think it's absurd. But many other passages support the Trinity. Um, But laying that groundwork, I'm not talking about this oneness, Pentecostalism. We preach Jesus only. Jesus only for salvation. It's not Jesus and something. It's not Jesus saying you got to go to this church. It's not Jesus and you got to pay this much to this church. It's not Jesus and you've got to do this certain action. Or Jesus and you got to be baptized. Or Jesus and you got to be good to keep it. It's not Jesus and something. It's Jesus only. Others may preach something and then mix Jesus into it. And we see that a lot now, where they'll, they believe something that's off the wall, and then they'll throw in the name Jesus, but it's not the Jesus of the Bible. It's something that's twisted and wrong. The Bible teaches Christ alone, Jesus only. John fourteen six. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 1 Corinthians 1, 23-24. But we preach Christ crucified, Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Acts 4.12 Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus only. And I love that. And it bugs me that people mix just those two words up. How can they miss it on just those two words? Jesus only. Christ came on purpose to die for our sin. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't because he was forced to do it. He came on purpose. He planned it. There's intent behind it. An intent that has a love behind it that is beyond explainable. First, a person has to see their sin. For a person to be saved, they've got to see that they're a sinner. If they don't see it, they're not going to want. They're not going to see a penalty for sin. They're not going to see the consequences of it. They're not going to really understand salvation, why they need to be saved. 
But when a person sees their sin, they need to understand how their sin relates to Jesus. That's another side of it, too. Not just seeing that their sin are utterly broken, but understanding how their sin relates to Jesus Christ, and it does relate to Jesus Christ. Jesus took our sin upon him and nailed it to his cross. When a person really sees their sin on Jesus, what he had to do for us, we will hate it, we will mourn it, we will abhor it. Do you understand that? When we see what our sin, when we really see it, what our sin did to Jesus, necessitated him to do, to die on the cross, we will mourn that sin, we'll hate that sin, we'll abhor it in our lives and we'll run from it. That'll be our life. That'll be our heart. That's salvation. That's the right heart in a Christian to hate sin, to desire not to sin because of the cost. We also have to realize at the same time that that sin is no longer burdening you. The sin was on Jesus. He took that sin. We are forgiven in him. And there's a balance to walk there. And some of us men have talked about this, about that balance. Understanding that we still sin, but understand that we're utterly forgiven. Our p- position is in Christ. We are one of the children of God. Yet daily, we still fail. And we still sin. And there's a balance in understanding that we're absolutely saved in Jesus. But we have a daily relationship with God. We walk. And that's why 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We have that daily walk where we go to God and we're just honest with him. Lord, I failed here. I sinned here. I don't want to do it. I wish I wouldn't enough, yet I did. Please forgive me. Help me walk better. Help me avoid temptation. The entire Christian life is a walk of balance. It's not a walk of extremes in any direction. It's a walk of understanding how God is a balanced God. Often people actually take God and they make him extreme in one area. And then it goes into some cult or some fallacy or something. The Calvinists emphasize his sovereignty above his mercy and his love. Um, the Arminians, it goes different directions. There's a bunch of different ways you can do that. You just, you understand God is complete and perfectly balanced. And that's what God wants in us, is to understand his word and walk in a balanced way according to his word. You know, this Jesus only, this thought, is our security. That's our security. If you think about that, it's not how good we can be to be saved, It's not how good we can remain to stay saved. It's not in our merit in any way. It's by the blood of Jesus. It's Jesus only. Some would say there's many paths to heaven. And you see it everywhere now. There is only one hope. And that leads to the cross where Jesus paid the price for our sins. That's only through the manifest mercy of our wonderful God. Jesus is the manifest mercy of God. He's the mercy of God in flesh. Jesus is the path. You know, some some believe in Buddhas, and there's a whole bunch of them. They're lifeless and false. They're dead. Some believe in Muhammad and his Allah. Muhammad, Muhammad, I can safely say, is in hell. And Allah is imaginary and demonic. Some believe in the Pope. But he may be worse than all the others. He literally tries to take the place of Jesus. He's an antichrist, not the antichrist, but one of many antichrists. And I'm being very direct right now. This might get me in trouble. Some put their trust in physicists, uh, we've heard this one, and we, we had one guy get really angry at us. But some people put their trust in physicists with high IQs. That's what their trust in, their hope is in. It's a humanism. Those men that have those high IQs, 
will die. And they'll be forgotten. And if they didn't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, they'll go to hell. The truth is, it's Jesus only. Jesus only is the only begotten Son of God. Jesus only is the perfect Lamb of God. Jesus only, being God, took on human form and came to die for us. Jesus only was able to pay our debt for sin. Jesus only is qualified to be our eternal high priest. It's Jesus only. Jesus only for salvation. Next point, Jesus only for serenity. And I alliterated, that's why I use serenity there. It's really peace. Serenity means calmness, quietness, stillness, and peace. Jesus only for peace. And I was thinking about this. Well, I'll just go through my notes here. Matthew 11, uh, verse 28. You can turn there. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. It's over just a bit. Very well-known verses. Matthew 11, verse 28, and we'll read through 30. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus only for peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I'd love to explain that peace, but it's past my understanding, as the verse says. It passes understanding. And I know the peace, but to be able to explain it, I can't put it in the words. Who's the peace through? Who is that peace through? It's Jesus. Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That peace can only be experienced by someone who has put their trust in Jesus alone for salvation. Jesus only. That peace cannot be experienced by anybody in this world. They don't understand it. This world talks about peace. Wanting peace, trying to do things for peace, politicians bringing peace, a peace from what They have no idea what peace is. It's Jesus only. That peace is based on our salvation, being in the person and sacrifice of Jesus. I don't understand. This is something I don't understand. I wrote this down. I don't know how a man can have peace when he believes he must work for his salvation. How can somebody have peace when they've got to be good enough. Whoever tells you you're good enough, when have you reached that point? Or to keep a salvation, how do you know you remained good enough to keep it? I I just don't understand that. For a blood-bought, born-again child of God, we can always look to Christ and his merit, not our own. It's Jesus only. That's peace. Because it settles it. As, as much as I fail, as much as I sin, as much as I, I hate it, but fail each day, it's on Jesus' merit, not mine. It's on his blood. It's Jesus only. It's not Josh and Jesus. It's on Jesus only. So where are our eyes, dire- where are our eyes directed? That's the, the question with this. Jesus only for serenity, so Jesus only for peace. Where are our eyes directed? If they're on Jesus, we can have peace. You can have a peace that passes understanding. If they're on ourselves, we won't have peace. We can't have peace. Because we can't walk perfectly before God. We can in Jesus because of his righteousness and his perfection and his sacrifice and his blood. But we ourselves, we still have that sin nature that we battle every single day of our lives. Romans 7, verse 18 through 25. You can turn to Romans chapter 7. I was just talking to one of the men about this earlier today. Romans chapter 7. 
verse 18. It says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which, I, which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me, deliver me from the body of this death? And here's the hope right here. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. His hope is in Jesus Christ. And that's our hope. Jesus only. Jesus only. We will be disappointed if we look at ourselves. We will. If, if our eyes are on the world, we'll also not have peace. You can't have peace looking at this world. If you just look at the news, it's a mess. The world is falling and getting worse every day. This world does offer momentary pleasures. You can go into this world have a momentary pleasure... But it doesn't satisfy long, and it often leads to destruction. Our peace, our peace, is not this country, but it's the new country in Hebrews 11. That's our peace. Hebrews 11, verse 13 through 16, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Do we seek a country? I seek a country. I'm looking forward to being where Jesus is. I look forward to that. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. This hope... This new country is based on Jesus. It's not based in looking at this world. It's Jesus only. If your eyes are on another man or a leader, you will be disappointed. It doesn't matter who it is in this world. You will be disappointed. All men will fail us. Only Jesus will not. You know, just some illustrations here. Many people will say Elon Musk. I'm sure many people here know who that is. Many people actually say behind the scenes, in Elon we trust. They insert Elon Musk's name for God. He will let them down. I'm sure he's already done it. Christian men, he's a lost man, but Christian men will fail us. And I'm going to use myself as this example because it's negative. I didn't want to put somebody else's name in here. I will let you down. I will disappoint I will hurt you at some point, if I haven't already. It will not be intentional, I hope. It'll be an error of the head and not an error of the heart. But every man will let you down. We can't have our eyes directed at other men for our peace another individual other than Jesus Christ. He's it. You know, many times we can clearly see what's wrong with other people. And we see that more clearly than what we see what's wrong with ourselves. So that should amplify the fact that other people will disappoint us. It's not a good thing. But we will disappoint too. It's something to understand about yourself. Don't try to have people follow you. Don't try to have, to be somebody they look to, direct them to Jesus. Tell them to look at Jesus. Tell them how wonderful Jesus is and what he's done. Jesus only offers peace. That's the point I make there. He's the only one to look at. Okay, third point. Jesus only for service. And I'm almost done here. And I'm going a little bit longer, so I'll make this quick. I always do that. Our service is acceptable through Jesus only. It's only through Jesus that we can serve God. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. We see above that in that same passage that Jesus is the mediator and the blood of sprinkling. It's only through Jesus that we can serve God acceptably. So Jesus only for salvation, Jesus only for serenity or peace, and Jesus only for service. Jesus is everything to us. I mean, salvation, our peace while we live and in eternity, and then our service, what we do here. He is everything. Jesus only makes our peace, our, our service acceptable. What is our motivation for service? Many people serve God to ingratiate themselves to God. I mean, many people have that little thought in their head, I'll do this and maybe God will like me more because I'm doing this. Many people go a lot farther and they, they serve God to purchase their salvation, not realizing their service is not acceptable because it's not in Jesus Christ. Our service should be out of love for God. And that's, that's really based in salvation in Jesus Christ, what he's done. Understanding the love God showed to us, we desire to show love to God. We are reactive. God is the one that initiated it. We just respond to his love. There's so many, so many things to say in this, but I'm not going to go much further on that. Our service is based in Jesus Christ. Our peace is based in Jesus Christ. Our salvation is based in Jesus Christ. We're in a crazy world here. I mean, it's, it's nuts. And it's getting crazier exponentially. The things in the news, there's commercials. They wouldn't have even talked of behind closed doors. But they're on TVs now. Commercials are. The things they're trying to pass in schools, the things they're trying to do everywhere. This world is on fire. That's probably, I think, the best way to say It's on fire and it's burning down. And this country, honestly, it's sad, but it's turning wicked. Directly against God and his commands and God's word. Absolutely immoral. This world's on fire. In this time, with everything going on, who are we looking to? We shouldn't be looking to politicians to fix everything. We shouldn't be looking really even to our country. I mean, I... The USA has been a wonderful country, blessed by God. It was based on Christian principles, but it has veered off. And missionaries are coming here trying to win people to the Lord because this place is becoming so wicked and anti-God. If you are not born again, saved, been washed in the blood of the Lamb, you are standing before a gaping maw of hell and judgment. You're standing on the precipice of eternity and fire and burning forever. Jesus can save you. Jesus only can save you. If you are not saved, and I know the people here have heard this message many times, but if you're not saved and don't understand it or don't understand it yet, ask someone here. Any Christian would love to share what it means Salvation. And I think about the people that grew up in church or have been in church a long time. There are many people that have been in church for years and they would feel ashamed to walk forward and say they, were una- they weren't saved, that they were never saved. Ignore that shame because that's from Satan. Any Christian... Any Christian would love to see somebody that sat in church for 20 years walk forward and get saved. That would make their week, their month, their year. There would be praising God. There is no shame in getting saved. Jesus took the shame. He paid the price. It's Jesus only. 
Do you have that peace that passes understanding? That's what I would ask you. In this day, in this hour, in this time, and this is, I'm trying to encourage the Christians here. Do you have that peace? Don't look at the world. Don't look at men. Don't look at the other things. Look at Jesus only. Jesus only. Do you serve? Why do you serve? Jesus only makes us acceptable. Love for God is our motivation to serve. Not getting to get up in front and have people look at you. It's a love and a surrender to God because he deserves it. Jesus only is our hope. And I'm going to end with this verse. I love this verse. It's a a memory verse, but it's in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5b. I cut it in half. 5b and 6. It says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's in Jesus only. Everything in Jesus only. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I ask, Lord, that you would encourage somebody here. May the people here, Lord, take this thought with them out this week. And, Lord, thinking about Jesus, how our hope is in your Son. Lord, our future, our salvation. Our peace, everything is in Jesus. Oh, Father, you're a wonderful God. And Lord, I just pray that we would be open and receptive to what was said here. Lord, that we would think on it and and take it and use it. And Lord, that we would rest in Jesus, not how good we can be. We want to be good. We want to obey your word because you deserve it, because we want to love you. But Lord, we don't do it to be saved. Our salvation is in your Son alone. Father, help us just be be good servants. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed.